everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise, and this is 10 to Life, where we talk all things true crime. So if you have never been to this channel before, you've never seen me on your YouTube screen, and you stick around and appreciate today's case coverage, I hope you consider supporting the channel by hitting the subscribe button. And for all of my returning 10 to lifers, of course, welcome back. As always, I love having you guys here, and you are going to definitely be no stranger to the case we are talking about today. We're doing a little bit of a case removal from the vault. It's a case that we have talked about many times on this channel, but there have been some updates. Also, a lot of the conversation we had was pieced between several different videos. So what I want to do, like I have been doing recently, that I am getting a lot of positive feedback from you guys on, so I want to keep doing it this way, is that when there are case updates and it's something that maybe we had talked about a year or so ago, I'm really trying to make sure that we are putting all of the case updates in one single video together so that start to finish you can get a full understanding of the case, especially for all of the new viewers on the channel. So that's what we're doing today. We're going to be talking about updates in this case. We're going to do a little bit of um, a history lesson on this case, and it's one that I just want to warn everybody is definitely not easy to hear. Not that many of them are, obviously. But this one is incredibly tough, and it's the case of 10-year-old Lily Peters. So guys, let's get right into it. Tend to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. Lily Peters was a 10-year-old girl and 4th grade student at Parkview Elementary School in Chippewa, Wisconsin. Chippewa has a population of approximately 14,700 people. It's a very small town and very tight-knit community. On Sunday, April 24th, Lily rode her bike to her aunt's house, and her aunt lived approximately four blocks or a quarter mile away from Lily. Later that evening, though, Lily was reportedly seen leaving her aunt's on her bike and never returned home. So Lily's family checked the area and contacted friends and family members, but couldn't find Lily anywhere. Around 9 p.m. that evening, Lily's father notified the police that she was missing. Now, as I mentioned, her house was only four blocks away from her aunt's house. So what could have happened to Lily in less than the five minutes it would take to ride her bike from her aunt's house back home? Police began searching for this little 10-year-old girl on Sunday night. Eventually, they found her bicycle near a wooded area by a walking trail near her aunt's house but Lily was nowhere to be found. So when their initial searches failed to actually turn up Lily, additional resources were brought in. They had additional police units, they had canine teams, drones, all these different people and you know avenues of searching were asked to come in and assist. Search teams also went door to door throughout the night in an effort to determine where Lily was. But unfortunately, just 12 hours later, on Monday, April 25th, the body of Lily Peters was located in the woods at 9.15 a.m. She was located near her aunt's house, close to a walking trail at the end of Grove Street and Lining Kugel's Brewery parking lot. And it was that same location where her bike had been found just the night before. And this is just a two minute ride from her aunt's house, guys. Now, when you look at Google Maps, the walking trail that she was found on and that her bike was found on is hard to see through satellite images. However, here you can see the entrance to the walking trail. It appears to have lots of terrain, woods on both sides, lots of tall greenery, making it extremely easy for someone to hide and potentially attack someone. And if you look at this image here, it's Prairie Street, which actually runs parallel to the trail. So essentially, Lily was riding on this desolate path alone with the woods on either sides of her. And although it may seem risky and potentially dangerous in hindsight, remember, this trail is only a two minute bike ride. And after those two minutes, you're back on public streets. So I'd imagine that Lily had taken this trail before and that she wasn't really concerned about it because it's such a short ride. But what's interesting is there's another path that you can take from her aunt's house to Lily's house that's actually two minutes shorter and appears to be on public streets the entire time. So I can't help but wonder why Lily didn't take that path or did she 
And was she lured or taken to the other path, to that walking trail? So who was this monster that was lurking in the shadows that night who chose to blitz attack this sweet, innocent little girl, Lily, attacking her in less than the two minutes it took for her to enter and exit that trail? Good afternoon and thank you for coming. My name is Matthew Kelm and I'm the Chief of Police for the Chippewa Falls Police Department. This is an update on the missing person case that was first reported last night. At about 9 o'clock last night, the Chippewa Falls Police Department received information that Ileana Lily M. Peters, age 10, was missing from the city of Chippewa Falls. Lily's father reported that she had not returned home from a visit from her aunt's house at 400, in the 400 block of North Grove Street. Officers later located a bicycle in the woods near the walking trail between the end of North Grove Street and the Line of Brewery parking lot. Numerous agencies and resources were called to assist with the search for Lily. At about 9.15 this morning, a body was located in the wooded area near the walking trail. The Chippewa County Coroner's Office has now confirmed that this is the body of Lily Peters. At this point, we are considering this a homicide investigation. We do not have anyone in custody at this time, and we are continuing to follow up on multiple leads. The Chippewa Falls Police Department has numerous assisting agencies, and we'd be willing and we will be working diligently and tirelessly on this case. We encourage anyone with information to please contact the Chippewa Falls Police Department and to maintain a state of vigilance as there may be a danger to the public. To maintain the integrity of this very active and ongoing investigation, I am unable to pr provide any further details at this time. I do anticipate an additional press conference around 5 o'clock tonight. We would like to extend our deepest sympathies to the family and friends of Lily Peters during this tragic time. Chief, Thank you. I can see in your eyes, I can hear in your voice. This is not the ending you had hoped and prayed for. What has this been like for you in the department after making that discovery? Well, as you can imagine, uh, first responders are tremendously impacted by anything that, that, uh, anything that impacts one of our children. So it is very difficult for them and the investigators. Um, so I wish, uh, thank you for your patience and we will provide more information as soon as we're able to. So thank you. Get one line, Chief, about a concern in the community. Did you talk about that? So at this point, police suspected that Lily was a victim of homicide, but no arrests had been made. Without any suspects or leads, rumors led to speculation, and fear was beginning to heighten among many in the community. Among these rumors, one was that she was strangled, another was that she was located in a river, and most disturbingly, that her relatives actually discovered her body. Now, what kind of crime could have claimed the life of a 10-year-old girl in just the blink of an eye? Was this a concern to the community, and should all parents in this small, close-knit community now also be worrying about their children? I know I would be. But police encouraged parents and the community to stay hyper-vigilant in case there was, in fact, a sick and deranged predator out there. And rightfully so, Lily's Elementary School sent out a letter to parents recommending that they physically pick up or drop off their children themselves because the community didn't want to risk one more child walking or biking alone. And I completely understand that. After receiving well over 200 tips on Tuesday, April 26th, authorities issued a search warrant for the home of Lily's aunt. It's unclear if this search turned up any evidence, but it does remain taped off. And again, it is believed to be the home of Lily's aunt. And the suspect of this horrific crime, this person who killed this 10-year-old innocent little girl, was a 14-year-old boy. And he was taken into custody Tuesday. And at the time, he was only identified with the initials of CPD because he was a minor. However, this person made several comments to authorities and to his sister, allegedly, how he planned to essay and kill fourth grade student Lily Peters and how he had planned this, in his words, from the get-go. And what is more awful than a 14-year-old being capable of doing this is that that 14-year-old is her cousin. He detailed his premeditated plans for Lily that he held as they left the home together, plans that he followed through on. So Lily's cousin, this older eighth grade boy, was clearly obviously familiar with Lily. They were family, they were blood cousins, and he may have even lived at the home of her aunt. Details in the death of a 10-year-old Chippewa Falls girl. According to a criminal complaint released today, the 14-year-old boy charged in Lily Peter's death told a detective that he intended to 
and kill her. The complaint says he did that after luring her off of a trail by suggesting they explore surrounding woods. He then left her body in the woods, but did return later to try and cover up her body with leaves. The boy remains in custody on a million dollars bond. The new criminal complaint that has been unsealed has given us some truly awful details. The first thing that we learned was that Lily was actually tricked by her 14-year-old cousin Carson. And Carson specifically had this entire thing planned out in his very own disgusting way. He knew what he was going to do to Lily before they even left the house. So Carson helped Lily walk with her bike as she left her aunt's house to return home, which was literally under a five minute commute. As they left her aunt's house, Lily walked with her bike alongside of her and Carson took his hoverboard. Carson asked Lily to then explore off the trail with him. Once they were off the trail, Carson hit Lily with a large stick in the head three times. Once Lily was then on the ground laying on her back, he then straddled her and strangled her. After Carson believed that Lily was deceased, he removed her pants and he went on to SA her. He also told investigators that at some point he bit her. And we're going to get back to that detail in a little bit here as we go through more of these updates because I wanna just make mention of that. Carson then stated that he got scared. So he ran home, he showered, and put all of his dirty clothes in the laundry. When he heard that people were out looking for 10-year-old Lily, he went back to where her body was, moved it, and covered it with leaves. When Lily was found just 12 hours after her father had called the police to report her as missing, she was found without her pants on. So let's pause really quickly at this first update because there are just many thoughts behind this. First off, did nobody in the family notice that Carson was gone or was acting strangely at home? Because when Lily's dad was questioning where everybody was, what happened to Lily, did Carson's mom or mom's boyfriend not question where the last time Carson saw Lily was, especially if they knew that he left the house with her that night? Wouldn't they have asked, okay, well, where did you leave her off at the trail or did you walk her all the way home? Why wasn't there any piece of information there connecting? Now, in my last couple of videos, we've spoken about strangling being a very, very personal way to end somebody's life. And this case just reaffirms that. And unfortunately, there's another detail I'm gonna share in a minute here that just again kind of reaffirms that even more as far as a very personal and hateful thing to do to somebody. So the way that Carson just casually went home and showered and then laundered his clothes is just beyond creepy. Shows that maybe, yeah, he was scared, but clearly there wasn't any remorse. He was going on as business as usual, especially because then when he heard that people were looking for Lily, he went back to the scene of the crime, dragged her lifeless body a few more feet, and covered her with leaves. And at that point, he didn't attempt to put her pants back on, meaning that he didn't care if she was found in that way, which again leads me to believe that there was just no remorse here. Not to mention, of course, that it was planned out before this even happened. It wasn't something that he just did in the heat of the moment. He had planned this before they even left the home that evening. But what I also wonder about that is when he went back to her body the next morning to move her, was nobody keeping tabs on this kid? Because if somebody's niece was missing or a family member, first of all, you wouldn't allow them out of the house because at that point too, all of the school district was like not on lockdown, but they were on high alert. The police were advising parents not to allow their children to walk to school or walk home from school because they said that there was a predator on the loose. So they were allowing their son to go out without supervision, but also if you knew that he was the last one to see her alive, why wouldn't you be keeping tabs on him to see where he's going? There's just a lot of disconnect here. So it seems like these parents were possibly just absent entirely or not paying attention. And according to people in the community, Carson was also at Lily's vigil the very next day. That night that she was found, he was there. And we've heard of suspects and perpetrators often inserting themselves into the investigation or showing up at the vigil to gauge what the response is and what people are saying. But people in the community mentioned seeing him comforting his family and hugging them. And the fact that he was there doing that, knowing he's the one that not only took Lily's life, but the one who brutally essayed her body is just 
beyond evil and personally, in my opinion, demonic. The autopsy showed that Lily had bite marks on her left buttock. She also had SA trauma to her backside and blunt force trauma to the left side of her head. Now we know that Carson admittedly hit her with a stick three times in the head to subdue her and get her to the ground. He also admitted to investigators to biting her, but she had tearing on her backside. So there is SA that took place, you know, in Lily's rear. It's unknown if it also took place in the front area, but it is confirmed that she had tearing. Now the bite mark, let's talk about that for a minute because it does kind of remind me of Ted Bundy in a way. He also left bite marks on his victims. And it's just heartbreakingly sad that this poor innocent 10 year old little girl was not only subjected to this kind of violence and hatred and physical brutality, but also that she was subjected to it by her own cousin, who is a 14 year old boy. If a 14 year old boy can be that evil and disconnected and calculated and cold to his own cousin, imagine what he could possibly unleash to other people in the public as he grows into adulthood and maturity in the sense of learning how to hide things more easily or wanting a challenge, something that's you know escalating to the next level. It's just really, really unsettling to think about. And the most upsetting and sad piece of information I think in this whole case is how scared Lily have had to have been in those final moments of her life. Walking home from her aunt's house with her cousin, thinking that he's just walking her home to get her home safely and wants to go explore the trail, which you do with family members and friends, you know, just to kind of go see what's going on and, you know, innocent enough, then to look back and be struck by a stick three times until you're on the ground and you see uh, your cousin who you love on top of you then seeing her falling onto her stomach him strangling her and then doing those horrible horrible things to her body post-mortem it's devastating to think about the level of true disgust packed into this case haunts me because not only do you have murder but you have i-n-c-e-s-t you also have necra you know where i'm going i mean it is just packed with so much and we're going to get into possibly the why here in just a second as it often is revealed many times crimes that are committed by children are because they too may have been victims themselves and carson's father is a convicted ped Adam Berger is 37 years old, and he has served three years in prison for possession of explicit content involving young, underaged girls. And an eerie letter surfaced from his incarceration back in 2020, begging the judge to allow him unsupervised visits with his son, calling his boy the best of him in this letter. Other members of the family cited how Carson has not been happy since his father was arrested back in 2018, and that he was unhappy with his mother about this and never smiling when he was in her company. His paternal grandmother called his mother, the sister of Lily's father, a bad mother who limited the boy's interactions with his father's family. So much so that his grandmother was granted grandparents' rights while his father was incarcerated. So the judge had denied the motion to allow Adam to see his son unsupervised, and it's unclear if he has seen his son since his release, because all of the photos that I was able to obtain of the two together appear to be from five years or earlier. He's currently living in a halfway house on supervised probation after his release from prison back in 2021. So my question here is, could Carson have blamed his mother for his father's incarceration because we know he was apparently angry in her presence, would never smile, and did that result in Carson carrying a hatred for females in general? Obviously, photos don't always attest to somebody's true character, but in these older photos I was able to find of Carson, he looks like a normal, happy young boy. Nothing like the current photo we have of him and nothing like the person who would commit such a vicious act on anybody, let alone their cousin. And again, pictures don't always tell the whole story, but to me, when I look at the two of these side by side, they don't even look like the same person. There's a new kind of evil behind the eyes. I can't help but wonder too, when I first heard that he had confided in his younger sister about this, 
it seemed odd to me because so and again this is all alleged at this point but apparently he confided in his younger sister and told her what he did after the fact and then the younger sister apparently told the grandmother and then the grandmother called the police and apparently everything kind of unraveled from there but my question with that and got what got me thinking is why did he tell his younger sister was it to brag or could it have been to scare her and could it have been to scare her into silence if she had been experiencing something from him as well because why else would you candidly tell somebody what crime you just committed and why unless you are trying to brag about it i don't know it just something doesn't sit right with me in that regard something t- is telling me that there was a reason and there was a calculated reason bef- behind him telling her but let me know what you guys think in the comments below Carson's grandmother sent a letter to Judge Ben Lane pleading with him to send Carson to juvenile court. In her letter, she said that Carson is and always has been a kind, caring, giving, and loving person. Also saying, I don't have the words to explain the pain that our family is going through. And I'm sure that's true, considering all of the different facets of this family that have been accumulating through generations to create this horrible murder. And I can only guess that this grandmother is also the grandmother of Lily Peters because her saying that her family has already lost too much and went through so much pain leads me to speculate as much, which would make her the mother of Carson's mother and Lily's father. She goes on to write about Carson's accomplishments in school, that his peers view him as a great role model and how he has never been in trouble, as if that somehow lessens the things that he's done, and the fact that he took the life of his 10-year-old cousin and brutally essayed her after she was dead. Saying things like he has excellent character and positive behavior seems in very poor taste and almost like enabling behavior, to me at least. Going on to excuse his behavior as just a young boy who got mixed up and lost control just seems like a poor excuse for the actions that he committed, especially premeditated actions that he himself admitted to police that he had planned from the get-go, his exact quote. I can't imagine trying to justify this kind of behavior from my child or my future grandchildren or anybody, especially considering that they had just stolen the life of my other grandchild. How do you justify this? In documents now made available to the public, CPB's grandmother pleads that the case be sent to juvenile court so he can get the professional mental health care he needs. In her letter, she describes CPB as a kind, caring, giving, and loving person. She noted that he was chosen as student of the month this past February by his eighth grade classmates. And she says her grandson is just a young boy who got mixed up and lost control. The highlighting of his goodness ironically reminds me of pieces of the letter that his father had penned to his own judge for his case in which he had said that Carson was the best of me. She underwhelmingly acknowledged that he does need to be punished, but doesn't think that prison is a suitable punishment. She begged the judge to send him to juvenile court to, quote unquote, get the help he needs. Even mentioning that this is the opportunity to help a young boy figure out what happened and why. As though he is the victim here and needs help. No, 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 no. Her plea to the judge is clearly out of love and pain. I get that because I can't imagine all of the pain that their entire family must be feeling. She was even mentioning a threat to her daughter's life and that of her family in this letter too. So I get it. They're stressed and they're heartbroken. And Lily's mother also condemned these online trolls for harassing her family. So it's hard to understand all of these like inner workings within a family, let alone one with so much trauma that has happened generation over generation, because we have no idea what truly did happen to these kids, Carson included, behind closed doors or what continues to happen behind them. But this letter just brushed me all sorts of wrong. Carson's lawyer also brought up concerns about a video that was posted to YouTube. Not this video, not any on this channel, but probably will after this. And the video airs what sounds like audio from a police officer, something that had apparently not yet been made public. So Carson's lawyer told the judge that the video includes information that he believes also is false. And he said it also includes information that he has not seen himself and is concerned that the video could create inappropriate bias or taint a jury pool. And he gets pretty heated as he delivers this argument and information to the judge. Take a listen. 
Uh, Attorney Cohen, were there any other items that you wanted to address today as discussed? We did receive some additional correspondence from you. Your Honor, there's one issue. Um, as the court knows, I, I wrote the correspondence and I did discuss the idea of some type of, certainly within the court's authority, some type of uh, what I would call colloquially a, a gag order to try to limit certain pieces of information being disseminated to the public. Since the time that I wrote that correspondence, Your Honor, uh, I have been made aware, as from what I can tell, at least a million people have been made aware, that someone somehow provided information about this case in terms of specific pieces of evidence, video footage, phone calls, 911 calls, documents, and other things somehow have been leaked to someone who has now put a 30-minute video on YouTube where they have made my client into a cartoon figure. They have provided false information, or at least from what I can tell, false information. They have referenced information that, from what I know, I don't have, and from what I know from Mr. Newell's office, apparently... They say they don't have. Um, I have contacted YouTube. I have, on behalf of my client, attempted to begin a, uh, a privacy confidential strike against that to have it removed. Um, I have not been. I have not heard back from YouTube Corporation yet on this. But from what I can tell, at least as of two days ago, three days ago now, this video has been observed just by the time that it was released on June 3rd by over 800,000 to a million people. And frankly, Judge, when you, it, it's still available. I will send the court and Mr. Newell a link if they want to see it. It's still available. But this is the type of concern that I have about this case. The amount of information that is direct law enforcement information tells me that somehow information has been leaked out that is of a significant evidentiary nature, and I don't have it. But now almost a million people have seen it, and it has made my client into a cartoon figure, and it says things that are completely inappropriate. So to the extent that I now have evidence that something has occurred... I'm asking the court to, within its authorities, uh, instruct anyone that it can, and I understand your limitations, that there will be significant consequences for leaking of evidence about this case to the general public in such a fashion that appears to me for the purpose of doing everything possible to potentially taint a potential jury pool or cause some type of inappropriate bias towards my client. I'm not going to put up with it, Judge. All right. Attorney Newell, is that accurate that the state has no notice or information as far as where this information is coming from? I, until he mentioned it right now, I had no idea. And I, I guess I would ask for that that link so that the state can, can review that um, to determine if it is, in fact, law enforcement video or some other video or, or what it is. I can't comment upon it now because I have no idea what if what is is in that YouTube that YouTube video um, as a re, obviously the leaking of confidential information um, is already prohibited so I don't know that the court has to take any additional action now um, <clears throat> if the court wants to make a statement that that sort of information that that it's troubling if any sort of inform confidential information is leaked. I don't have a problem with that. And I talked to Attorney Cohen a little bit about this a while back when he filed the letter, but um, because there is no notice to anyone but the parties, I think the court could only put a gag order on the parties that are part of this action. I don't think and there's no law enforcement has notice of any hearing today regarding what they're allowed to say or not say um, about that. Obviously, as as um, an individual, I have certain constitutional rights as well under the First Amendment. I think I've done um, 
fine in not disclosing anything that is factually um, involved in this case other than it is, is a public record and out to the public as of now. I don't have a problem with there being a gag order um, in this matter to not talk about the, the facts of the case at all while the matter is pending either by the defense um, or, or the state for that matter. I mean, as the court knows, we also received favorable correspondence to the defendant, which is now part of the the media having that, which is the um, the letter that was that was provided to the court. I've seen in that in the media as well. So there's, it's it if it is in fact unfavorable video for the defendant, there is also favorable information that is being provided and making and made available to the media as well. I don't know how we stop people from filing things and and I don't know that there's a mechanism by which to to seal it um, as it comes in necessarily because as the court knows the the rules from the Wisconsin Supreme Court um, err on the side of transparency that everything that is filed is seen by the general public that it's open and available um, Obviously, we don't control the media. Neither of the parties control the media in that regard. I, like Attorney Cohen, want the defendant's rights to be protected. The job of the district attorney is not just to convict people. It's to make sure justice is done in the matter, and I want the defendant's rights to be protected as well. Um, I think I don't know exactly what the de defense is asking for. It's just that the parties not talk about the case factually. I don't have a problem with that. Attorney Cohen, are you aware of whether the, yes. po the posting party on this link is um, an entity that put this together or is this an individual posting party? Uh, do you have any information about that? A few things, for Judge. First, from what we can tell, it was put out by a man. It's called the Law and Crime Network. I will forward to your assistant your Honor, as well as to Mr. Newell, a copy of the link so that it can be viewed. Um, I do not, and then the next point, Judge, is that I agree with Mr. Newell. Anything that is filed in this case with the court is a public record that can be disseminated. I understand that. The concern that I have, Judge, is that when you see this video, you will realize relatively instantaneously that the information contained in it, almost all of it has not been disseminated to the public. It is not a public record. It is not in the court file. It is not something that's been filed for your review to determine whether it will be filed under seal or not. It is information that is drone coverage, drone video footage, 911 calls, police communication phone calls uh, between law enforcement officers. Um, it is documents. It is photographs. It is a 30-minute video, this montage, with this gentleman making all sorts of completely inappropriate commentary. Who the person is, I don't know. My concern is not that, and I'm not asking that, publicly, appropriately filed documents uh, somehow be shut down. That's not what we're talking about. What I'm talking about is my concern that somehow, somewhere, somebody gave out someplace significant information about this case, actual evidence which would potentially be introduced at a jury trial that is not public. And that is my concern. All right, I need to review this video because um, if that is the case, there are some concerns. I took an oath to uphold all the rights for our Constitution for the public and the First Amendment rights of our media and the public in general for information in this case, the defendant's rights and all the rights associated with him, the victim's rights that are in place for our Wisconsin Constitution and statute. So I need to make sure that everyone's rights are being met uh, and upheld as part of this matter. And so. Uh, I am concerned. I don't know if this is legitimate, as Attorney Cohen discussed. 
a cartoon image is is made of the defendant, and so I'm not sure if any of the any of this may be audio gener generated uh, or illegitimate um, uh, or not. Uh, it's hard to tell sometimes with digital production, but um, I need to make sure that all rights are being upheld in this matter. Um, Attorney Cohen, I, I as far as an order on other participants in this case, including public officials. The court does have some authority to address these issues and to restrict re uh, release of certain information by certain individuals. Um, the court does note, though, that uh, when there is a public official or an elected official involved with release of information or records, that under Chapter 19 of our statutes, that a separate civil action may be required to restrain that individual from releasing certain records. And if that is the case, uh, th this court may be limited in jurisdiction while acting in the criminal jurisdiction to issue an order against something that would be required in a civil jurisdiction matter. And so if that is the case, that would prohibit me from making any orders, but under other considerations, I may be able to do that. Do you understand? Judge, and, and you've already read my mind, um, and maybe by your questions, you had done that earlier. We are attempting through an appropriate investigation that we can to try to figure out how this information was released. I am fully aware of Chapter 19 and uh, the FOIA and the mechanisms that certain persons have to perhaps get some information. However, as you know, Judge, the information that can be released pursuant to a Chapter 19 release or a Federal Freedom of Information Act is limited and strictly protected, especially in pending investigations or ongoing criminal cases. And so if, for example, something was released, I'll just say it perhaps mistakenly by some what somebody would have thought would be an otherwise proper request, that does not mean that there are not actions or sanctions or remedies still nonetheless available. So we're investigating that, Judge. I don't have the answers for that today. But in follow, I was making the comments about the video because I became aware of that this week. And um, I didn't have a chance to get any additional information to the court prior to this hearing. But I had raised the issue tangentially, at least in my correspondence of a couple of weeks ago. The purpose of bringing the video to the court's attention today was to say, I wrote to you, now I have documented evidence that there's a potential issue, we're working to gather more information, and to the extent that you can, at least today, order some type of restrictions, or perhaps admonish all those that would otherwise be listening to this about making sure that they follow the law moving forward, that may be all you can do today, I recognize that. But it is a serious situation, and I and I have to protect my clients' rights to the best of my abilities. Well, I, I think it's fair that I direct not only the state, but the defense, law enforcement, and any other parties who may have obtained information regarding this matter that remains confidential, that has not been released as a public record as part of this matter, uh, or by any other public official according to Chapter 19 that it should not be released to anyone because it affects the rights and due process rights of the defendant. It affects the ability of the state to prosecute its case. Uh, there are a variety of issues that have consequences by releasing information that is still confidential in this matter. And so I would direct anyone who does have any of that information to not release it. And it goes for both sides. It's not just for the state and police. It also goes for the defense. Um, so that is something that I will enter here today. And again, um, I expect that that goes along with the officials and the authority that has the custodial rights to those records. But also that means the individuals that are under their control. And everyone who is under the control of those individuals should maintain that confidentiality as well. Now look, I am all about a fair trial and not doing anything to jeopardize this murderer facing the consequences for what he did to Lily. However, I don't believe this video alone, I've seen it, 
or the police audio alone, I've heard it, is enough to taint the jury pool. It's my opinion that the jury will need no convincing, given the evidence that we already know. I think that this is just a strategic and baseless argument by Carson's attorney as to hope for a mistrial or something in that direction down the line. Even if the police audio wasn't obtained lawfully, it doesn't necessarily pose any direct conflict to Carson himself. However, the judge said that he was concerned about the video as a whole, and he is going to review it. And the DA Wade Newell also expressed concern and said he will review it to see if it includes any legitimate law enforcement video. The complaint filed against Carson lists those three charges, first degree intentional homicide, first degree SA, and first degree SA of a child. And if this case remains in adult court where it is now, this guy, if he's convicted, he could spend decades in prison. As I said before, the preliminary hearing was scheduled for September 1st. However, at this hearing, Carson waived his right to the preliminary hearing. By doing this, Michael Cohen and his client essentially put on record that the facts in the criminal complaint are sufficient for the court to find probable cause. This isn't a guilty plea or anything like that. This is all just standard rhetoric, but it basically means that the defense isn't going to argue that there is no probable cause. And this is similar to what Lori Vallow did, if you follow that case. Instead, the defense indicated that they plan to file a reverse waiver petition, requesting the case be moved from adult court down to juvenile court. On September 21st, Carson's attorney filed a request for substitution of the judge, which was actually granted. Judge Stephen Gibbs will now preside over the case. On September 27th, the court released a notice of hearing indicating that the next hearing for the homicide of Lily Peters is set for August 7th, 2023, a year from now. So until then, we're going to have to wait for more updates and just hope that justice for Lily will be served. But the fact that they are trying to move this from an adult court to a ju juvenile court just sickens me because the offense was so deeply evil and rooted that it absolutely should be an adult court and he should be tried as an adult. This is like the most evil of the evil. So because the next hearing now is postponed until next August, we're going to have to wait for more updates. And I mean, in this time, all we can really do is keep Lily's family, their entire community, and our thoughts and prayers. And I'm sure that the news of waiting another year for justice is not what her immediate family wanted to hear. So just please continue to support them. I can't begin to wrap my mind around this. The details of this are just unbelievably heartbreaking and horrifying to hear. This poor, innocent 10-year-old girl was not only subjected to this kind of violence, hatred, and physical brutality, but subjected to it by a family member, someone that you are supposed to trust, someone she loved. Suppose a 14-year-old can be that evil, so disconnected, so calculated, and cold-blooded to his own cousin. Could you imagine what he could unleash on members of the public as he grows into adulthood, if he could do this on his own 10-year-old vulnerable cousin. Unless brand new breaking information comes out between now and then, I, I don't think we'll have an update, but I'm hopeful that justice will be served swiftly and effectively because the fact that this 14-year-old monster could do this to his 10-year-old cousin is just appalling. So please continue to keep Lily's family in your thoughts and prayers, and I will update you as soon as we know more. Okay, guys, until the next one, stay safe. Bye.